Every time I see her face, I feel sick. Oh dear, that's terrible. Sherry, please pack your things and leave. What if something happens to Betty's child because of you? I couldn't help but sigh at the malicious grins on my mother-in-law and sister-in-law's faces, realizing that all my efforts have been in vain. I reply quietly, all right, I'll leave. My name is Sherry, and I live with my husband Ellen in his family home. His father passed away, and since his mother has mobility issues, I knew we'd be living with her when we decided to get married. Before Ellen and I tied the knot, his mother was genuinely kind. She was always calm, smiling, and whenever I helped her, she'd say thank you. I thought living with such a mother-in-law would be manageable. That was the biggest mistake of my life. Once Ellen and I got married and started living together, her true colors began to show. First, she stopped thanking me for anything I did. I wasn't helping out just to hear her gratitude, so I didn't mind at first. But gradually, instead of thanks, she began to complain. You're so slow. Ellen will be home soon and you haven't cleaned the bath or finished dinner. What's going on? I apologized, explaining that Ellen just happened to come home early that day, and I was doing the chores as usual. If your husband comes home early, you should work faster. You don't care enough about Ellen. That's not true, I protested, but she cut me off. I don't want to hear your excuses. Poor Ellen, why did he marry someone like you? There was no trace left of the kind woman I had known before our marriage. Still, I tried my best to meet her expectations. I could keep going because of Ellen's support. In front of Ellen, she pretended to be the ideal mother-in-law, kind and considerate. But I talked to Ellen about how she behaved when he wasn't around. Ellen believed me and said, I'll talk to mom, and he did. After being scolded by Ellen, she behaved for a few days. But then she'd go back to her old ways. This cycle continued until one day she received a phone call. It was probably my sister-in-law, Betty, loudly badmuffing me so I could hear. Betty, who's married and currently pregnant with her first child, is just like her mother. She changes her attitude depending on the person and, frankly, has a bad personality. She once said, I never thought my brother would marry someone as wonderful as you. But now, she says, you're always causing trouble for mom. You're so useless. Mother-in-law and Betty have a weekly phone call where they bond over criticizing me. I was getting numb to it all. But after hanging up, my mother-in-law cheerfully called out to me and dropped a bombshell. Betty is getting a divorce. Her husband was a plain guy anyway, so it's for the best. Once she comes back for the birth, she'll stay here. You might not be needed anymore, Sherry. What? Oh, I can't wait. Make sure you prepare a feast for the day Betty comes home. I felt devastated. Until now, it had been mother-in-law versus me, but with Betty moving in, it would be mother-in-law and Betty against me. I was already worn down by mother-in-law's constant complaints, and the thought of another person adding to that was unbearable. Trying not to let mother-in-law see, I shed silent tears while vacuuming. I couldn't take this life anymore. A few days later, Betty arrived, heavily pregnant. She was in her ninth month. I greeted her with a hello, but she immediately complained, at least offered to take my bags. After taking her luggage to the room she'd be staying in, I heard her loud voice from the living room. Sherry really does have a plain face, doesn't she? As I prepared tea in the kitchen, Betty exclaimed, Oh, I can't stand it. Just looking at Sherry makes me feel sick. Next to her, my mother-in-law, laughing with a face just like Betty's, exaggeratedly said, Oh dear, that's terrible. Sherry, pack your things and leave. What if something happens to Betty's child because of you? Betty laughed mockingly. I had done my best for my mother-in-law, but it was never enough. But it seemed all for nothing. Feeling empty, I sighed and replied weakly, All right, I'll leave. I had anticipated this outcome from the moment I heard Betty was returning. I had always known that a day would come when I'd leave this house in either anger or sadness. I quickly grabbed my already packed bags, headed to the entrance, and picked up my car keys. Perhaps not expecting me to actually leave, my mother-in-law called out from behind, Oh, Sherry, are you really leaving? That's fine, but make sure you divorce Ellen. He deserves someone much better. I think that's for Ellen to decide. Thank you for everything, I replied calmly and left the house. I called my parents, who warmly told me to come home. They were furious when I told them about the comments from my mother-in-law and Betty. You don't need to go back to that house. They assured me, and for the first time in a while, I genuinely smiled.
That evening, the doorbell rang. When I opened the door, Ellen stood there. Welcome home, Ellen. Thanks. Living with your parents will be a bit nerve-wracking. Don't worry, you'll get used to it quickly. I guarantee it, I said, greeting Ellen with a smile and inviting him in. The first thing he did was apologize to my parents. I had told them how supportive Ellen had always been, so they felt bad about his apology. Instead, they thanked him for trying to protect me and warmly welcomed him, saying feel free to live here as long as you wish. Why did Ellen fit in so well with my parents? It was because when I found out Betty was moving back after her divorce, I had proposed a divorce to Ellen. I told him, I'm already struggling with your mother, and I can't handle Betty on top of that. And I cried, saying, even if it means divorcing, I want to leave that house. Ellen was shocked but immediately apologized, saying he hadn't realized how much I was suffering. He didn't want a divorce and had negotiated with my parents that if things got too bad, he'd move in with me at their house. It seemed that Ellen planned to live with my parents for a while and then buy a house somewhere else. I was overjoyed when Ellen came to my parents' house. I was happy that he chose me over his mother and Betty. My mother prepared a feast to celebrate our arrival. As we enjoyed our meal and relaxed, my phone rang. It was my mother-in-law. When I answered with a simple, Hello? I heard her panicked voice. Sherry, Ellen hasn't come home yet. It's already late. Do you know where he is? I've tried calling him, but he's not answering. I'm worried something's happened. Oh, Ellen's right here. It seems he's blocked your number, I said, turning to Ellen beside me. My mother-in-law's confused voice came through the phone. Ellen casually said, Yeah, I've blocked your number. I relayed this to my mother-in-law. What do you mean? Is Ellen with you? Yes, we're married after all. Send Ellen back immediately. Didn't you say you divorce him? Ellen doesn't want a divorce, and neither do I. This is a matter between a husband and wife, not something for a mother-in-law to dictate, I responded calmly. Suddenly, my mother-in-law burst into tears. Why? Why? She sobbed. Betty, seemingly unable to watch her mother any longer, took the phone and said, So you've stolen my brother? You're the worst. I haven't stolen anyone. Ellen and I are married. You might have a plain face, but you're so audacious. One day, my brother will see the truth, and you'll regret it, she spat out, and suddenly the call ended. I filled Ellen in on the conversation, and both of us, in disbelief, blocked my mother-in-law's number. I also got Betty's number from Ellen and blocked it as well. With a sigh of relief from cutting ties with them, Ellen and I began searching for a new home. After visiting various properties, we found our dream home and decided to move out of my parents' house. We expressed our gratitude to my parents, who had let us stay for several months. They told us, you can always come back, warming our hearts. One day, after settling into our new home and enjoying peaceful days, I received a call from an unfamiliar number. Considering we had just moved, I thought it might be a service provider and answered. To my surprise, an angry voice shouted, finally, you pick up. Confused, I asked, who's this? You've forgotten your sister-in-law? I realized it was Betty. Oh, Betty, how did you get this number? I was sure I had blocked you. She apparently changed her number when she got a new phone. I thought I'd have to block this one too, when Betty suddenly said, come back right now. I just had a baby and the house is a mess. Mom doesn't do anything. Well, mother-in-law has a bad leg, so it's understandable to some extent, right? That's no excuse. I'm struggling postpartum and she's using her leg pain to avoid doing any chores. From Betty's words, it was clear that she and mother-in-law weren't getting along. Neither of them wanted to do housework, so it was only natural that they pushed the responsibility onto each other. But that wasn't my concern. I'm sorry to hear that, but I have no plans to return. Why not? You haven't divorced Ellen, right? We're family. We should help each other. It's funny you consider me family now, I chuckled. Betty shouted in frustration but I wasn't faced. I won't have to see your face again. When you see me, he feels sick because of my plain face, remember? I'm truly sorry, but if I came back to help, he'd just feel worse. Besides, mother-in-law didn't want to live with me either. It's okay if you don't consider me family. I might not have lived with you, but I never bad mouthed you like mom did. I know you and mother-in-law used to talk about me on the phone. She would purposely put it on speaker so I could hear. I heard everything you said about me. Betty seemed to be searching for an excuse, but I told her I wasn't coming back and hung up. 
I immediately blocked her new number and resumed tidying up. That evening, a tired-looking Ellen came home and said, Betty called me today. She changed her number. It seemed Betty had called Ellen in tears. The relationship between mother-in-law and Betty was at its worst, with constant fights whenever they met. They even argued over household chores, sometimes throwing objects at each other. When Ellen, concerned about the newborn, asked about the child, Betty broke down crying. Shockingly, her child had been taken away by her ex-husband. He had pleaded with Betty, saying he desperately wanted to see the baby. In response, Betty had retorted, What do you want to see the child for? You're just a nuisance. Hearing this, her ex-husband declared he couldn't trust Betty with the child and took the baby away. In a fit of anger, Betty had said, Then you raise the child. Now regretting her words, she was embroiled in a custody battle. Meanwhile, mother-in-law's leg condition had worsened, and she had been advised to use a wheelchair, but there was no way Betty would care for her. Mother-in-law managed with a cane at home, but the day when she'd need to move to a facility she despised seemed imminent. Betty had apparently sought Ellen's help, but their predicament was a result of their own actions. Ellen reportedly told her, if you had treated Sherry right, you wouldn't be in this mess, before hanging up. He then blocked her number too. No matter how unreasonable they are, they're still family to Ellen. I worried that he might be hurt because of me, but he reassured me with a bright smile, saying you are my top priority, so it's okay. Besides, I'll be a father soon too. Smiling at Ellen's words, I gently caressed my growing belly, replying, that's right. For the sake of our unborn child, it's best to sever ties with mother-in-law and Betty. That's our decision as future parents. We have no intention of informing them about our child. Ellen, my parents, and I want to shower this child with all the love we can offer.